Hey everyone, it's Joan Isaias here, and uh, today we want to talk a little bit about why you should want to learn objects or classes. And for me, you know, I've been I've been playing with them for quite a while now, but I haven't really been developing my own. And so that's why also I had Isaias create the course, and I help with the outline stuff. But we want to talk about some of the high points of it. One of the first ones is just, hey, there's a lot of really cool libraries out there, classes out there, and objects out there that if you don't understand classes and objects, you, you can't use them. <laughs> that is true. It, it opens a, a lot of possibility, uh, a lot of possibilities, especially with COM objects, because those are objects that are native to the OS at this point, right? And if you don't know how classes or objects work, right. then you, you're closing the door <laughs> on yourself in that in that sense. Here, I put together a quick list of the, the ones that I've we've used a lot, right? Of the, the, on the left are just classes, that you might use. And, and you can, if you don't know classes, you can kind of fumble your way through it, but it's really hard. And, you, you know, there's a lot of advantages we're going to talk to in a second here. And on the right are, are objects. And, and that's another one. There's probably, but over like a thousand com objects on your computer, right? Yeah. So this list, they're crazy long, but um, it is, it's one of those things like, man, if you don't know objects and stuff, you're really limiting yourself in what you can do. Right. Especially the one that I find the most interesting is the HTTP request object. Absolutely. Because yeah, yeah, API calls because now that opens the door to connect with a lot of services that are uh, in the web that actually use HTTP requests for it. And if you do not know how to use that object, you're limiting your scripts to local oh, yeah. things, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and another good example of that is just COM in general, right? COM yeah. programmatically connects to many, if not, I don't want to say most, but Microsoft programs. Yeah. It allows you programmatic access to, to do stuff instead of sending keystrokes and doing things. Yeah, like the Excel object, the right. Word object. Whoa, yeah. that, those are amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, now, the next one, which is it's still related to this, is I got really excited about it. It didn't really dawn on me until, as Ace was mentioning it, one of the things is you get to use uh, the dot notation, object-oriented code, to access like methods in it makes it so much easier to understand what you're doing because yes. you're kind of using verbs and using things. And it's just, it's just a much sexier, easier way to understand. <laughs> yeah. And it makes your code encapsulated in that object. So it doesn't interact with the global variables on your code and other things. So that is really good. And, and this encapsulation also takes the form of keeping all your code in kind of like a topic, which is something very very uh, uh, helpful, especially when you're reading code and and uh, sharing it with others. Everybody has a clear idea of what the main topic of that object is. That object is just for Word, so it is a Word object, right? However, and this is the interesting thing to me, because you showed me, and I forget what we were working on, but um, the nice thing about a class, like it, my Excel function library, everything begins with Excel, but it's all Excel stuff. But, you know, if there's other things that actually you would use with Excel that aren't part of Excel, you can still have it in the same overall class, put it in a separate area, right? Mm -hmm. But it's still, it's under the same overall class. And that's how yes. it can really help you organize your code, which is a really that great That is right. That is right. Now, um, we did mention a little bit of inheritance in a recent video as well. Right. That yeah, why that is a really good idea. Uh, and using classes as a template to create objects that relate to one another, but just have minor differences, and that makes your code as well. In the example that we showed, a little bit easier to manage, especially when you're adding new classes, like new instances. Uh, <laughs> it makes everything a little bit easier to manage. That's another thing. Yeah, and keeps it very well organized and doesn't repeat a lot of code, which you would have had to do if you organized differently. And yeah, I, I totally agree on that. Um, the next one, which doesn't come up as much for me, but it's like a template. You know, that's how usually when you see start learning classes, that's how people teach it. Here's a template of a door or an animal. And I'm like, okay, I don't, I don't, <laughs> like, I, I don't understand how I would use with, that. <laughs> with a GUI, I totally get how I might have multiple instances of a GUI. And how when you do that, it's so easy to, to be able to just give it a different name and connect to it and have all the properties to it or use the methods on that instance. So it's yes. very, very powerful. And basically, and, and this relates as well with the inherit inheritance concept that we talked about. But for example, you create a class for a button, right? 
and all your buttons are from that class. But now, if you're showing an HTML button, the show function for the HTML button is different than if you're showing your button in a Windows 32 window. Mm -hmm. So now the show method for the Windows 32 button is a little bit differently as well. So when you use the template, the basic template, and then modify it just a little bit to uh, refer to an HTML button or a Win32 button, you just change a little bit on, but they're both based on the same template. <laughs> it, it almost, and maybe I'm too off here, it almost to me is the description of um, COM in the first place where you were talking about like COM is a translator, right? Yes. And, and that how, hey, I'm going to give you stuff and it's going to work, but it, it's built that relationship of if you're doing this, okay, we'll, we'll apply it that way. Um, and, and I can see now with classes how you're building that into it and compartmentalizing it in a really smart way to allow the program to do the hard work and heavy lifting. And you don't mentally have to start managing all that other crap that would really be crazy if you were trying to do that yourself. Yes, that is right. And um, right now, what I would say mainly is that it allows you to add capabilities to an already existing object without breaking the object. Right. Yeah. Right. So that, that is also another, another part of it that is really important. Yeah. Um, and I know from, from talking to you as well, scope, right? Being able to compartmentalize and have just these variables locally in here. And, and that works with functions too, but this just takes it to the next level of nesting everything even deeper. Right. And yeah. I think, and this is where I would kind of like make a specification on that. When you have a library, a, a function library, and you have two functions that work on the same variable, now your variable is in the global scope, right? Because that variable has to be outside of the two functions oh, okay. for them to access them, right? right? Right. But when you add a class around that, now the variable is not global anymore. It's within the class. It's within the class. And actually, I, I, I talked to CEO regarding a specific issue with one of his uh, variables that he had a variable outside of the class. And I said, like, what happens if somebody else has a variable named web, web request? It was the name of the variable, like web request. What will happen if somebody has a variable name like that? Now, you're, now your library is going to break. Right. But if you put it inside the class, your user can have any variable he wants, but it, your variable is not going to be touched. So those are the things with the scope that with the scope and it helps a lot in debugging because the debuggers usually separate global variables from local ones and all the class variables show up in the local space, which isn't cluttered. You're going to have a very small list if your object doesn't have thousands of variables, of course, which shouldn't be like that anyways. <laughs> but yeah, those are the things about scope. I, I would definitely recommend using classes because just because of that one. It helps you debugging your code. Yeah, yeah. and I remember talking to, to someone years ago about um, the ability to, to control what's exposed. So I could be working on something and I could have a whole different group of people doing stuff. And I can just tell them, look, here are the, the things that you're going to be able to feed my objects or my class. Yes. Right. And, and this completely compartmentalized and it's just a good security thing. Now, auto hotkey, at least you said something about version one versus version two. There's a difference. Right. Uh, there's a little bit of a difference there, but, uh, remember auto hotkey as a scripting language. It has a lot of, it is really permissive and it is really flexible. So we don't have a, a lot of control when it comes to that. But in other languages, you have private and public functions and variables which means that a programmer cannot access some variables which are made private, right? In AutoHotKey, you can access all of them, but there are some restrictions, especially in version two, because I could set up, and I was showing that to see as well, static methods. And that means that my instance cannot access that method at all. It would give you a, a, an error. It's going to say like, that method is not part of this object. But that is one of the parts of what you're just mentioning, controlling what the developer can access, there is a degree of that in new version two. In version one, not so much. But again, if you do it in the comments, you can add a section that says this is the public API and people can know that these are the things that I can access and everything below that is not, for example. That's okay too. 
it makes everything simpler because I can have a list of five functions that you can access while my object can have like 100 functions that do very specific things for itself internally, but that you, you don't need to learn them. You don't need to use them. You just use the ones that are public and that makes it easier for you. And then lastly, I had polymorphism, but I'm, was that where you're doing different things? Yes. Different, so, the, yeah. 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 So polymorphism allows you to have a function or an object behave differently if you call it in a different way. And, and the easiest way to think about this is just imagine a function that allows you to add two, three, four numbers. If you call the function with just two numbers, it would add two numbers. But if you call it with three numbers, it would actually add the three numbers. So, so it's the same function, but it's behaving differently depending on how many parameters you pass to it. That is a way of polymorph polymorphism. And with objects, you have that in the general sense. It's not only about methods and functions. It also works with many other instances of the, of the class itself. So, yeah. This was just a quick outline of the, the why you should want to learn objects. If you sign up right now on this URL we're showing, then you can get a discount when you purchase the course. We're, we're still working out how much we're actually going to charge for it and how we're going to distribute it. But, uh, yeah, I hope you guys are interested. It, it, I'm, I'm, I've been through 90% of the videos so far, and I learned a lot. The other thing I did want to mention is we actually, I, I told Isaiah's, even though we kind of assume you'd know a lot about stuff, if you didn't know functions and other stuff, then this course would be impossible. So let's include that in the course. And so we talk about using functions, using basic objects, doing stuff, and then we step into doing classes and more advanced stuff. Yes, and, and remember that we dive into very, uh, there's a few examples in there. One of them is really complex, like doing API calls and stuff like that. that it, if you're interested, if you, if you already know how objects work, you might want to take a look at that to see real life examples of how we would use objects in certain situations, programming situations. That might be a little bit more complex for some people, but. Well, the, the one thing which I kept telling him was like, I want to have several, you know, good examples because real world examples, not just the the whole, like it's a plant when they all have <laughs> legs, right? I want a real world example where we can demonstrate, you know, using it and how it's helpful because it's one of the things I often find in courses where you, you learn something and you get one example. And, and it is an abstract if it one. Doesn't click for you, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, exactly. You know, <laughs> you know, having yeah. real world, real, even though they're harder to follow, but what we're hoping is by doing different examples, at least one of them, you know, should be closer to what you're trying to do. And that way it, it makes more sense to you because that's what really helps, right? If you already understand that topic. And that's the thing when we're getting these abstract examples about the cat and the dog and so on, when you are in programming, you're not going to see a cat or a dog, right? You, you might see an example that is really complex code. And I'm just showing how it would make it easier for you when you use a class. So yeah, that should be good. Awesome. So sign up. Cheers. Bye.